Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our um, week five of class on emotional wholeness. So glad to see all of you. Uh, welcome to our e-learning students as well. Um, so glad that uh, you're following through, you're learning, you're interacting. Uh, keep going, keep, keep the journey going. And uh, for all of our students here, <clears throat> uh, we, I'm, you know, we're praying that uh, even as we do these courses, it becomes more lessons, uh, life lessons, more um, uh, ways of how we can grow spiritually as well. And um, so much more in, in a, uh, you know, in a course like this on emotional wholeness, something that all of us need um, at different points of our lives. We may be at different places, different levels in the way that uh, we are emotionally. Some of us may be going through seasons of hardships, uh, seasons of peace, yet we know that um, as we learn through scripture that God has given us uh, from his word the authority to to bring about to bring about healing minister deliverance to others as well as to ourselves so we're in the <clears throat> process of learning that and um, if you've been following through uh, we've been taking you know we've been going in uh, in an order on uh, on on uh, this this entire topic uh, the first week we did look uh, initially at uh, looking at the different problems of the soul. Uh, then we looked into the causes of some of these problems. Uh, and last week we were um, focused on restoration, restoring the soul or like we had like we had learned in the initial weeks that problems do occur some, that come as a result of our circumstances or our situations, some coming as a result of what we may be doing um, in error, some coming as um, an oppression from the enemy. A lot of that is what we covered initially. Then we looked at uh, um, it is now, now if we are in that place, what's next is to be able to come to a place of restoration. How um, do we come to um, restoring or repairing the soul from these emotional hurts and emotional um, uh, brokenness. Okay, so um, would somebody like to uh, quickly um, highlight what we learned last week so that you know, one, there is some interaction. I know everybody's awake, everyone is here, um, and there is also some people talking apart from me. So uh, would, you all, would somebody like to uh, quickly, in around three to five minutes, and, and you could all take turns to do that, to uh, highlight what we spoke about last time. Yes? So... We were on, maybe I can give you the page number also so that I think you all can, you all can follow that along. I think we were on page um, 14. Sorry, I'm just opening that. <clears throat> on page 14, yeah. On page 14. So maybe you could quickly open up your notes and... Uh, skim through, scan through and say, ha, huh, yeah, this is what we did. And, you know, uh, just bring about certain points that we were talking about. Wow, this is called pin drop silence. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Abhi. <laughs> yes, I, uh, go ahead. I really remember how you uh, thought about uh, we getting the inner wholeness through the finished work on the cross. So uh, you explained Isaiah 53, and uh, I, that was something that I received very beautifully. And 
I remember how what Jesus did on the cross has given us uh, everything and inner wholeness comes from there. That's what I remember. So I just wanted to share. Thank you, Abni. Thank you. That's that's nice. Yes. One point that Abni brought about was um, the basis of our healing and deliverance is because of what Jesus did on the cross, what he provided for us on the cross. And it was his punishment that uh, that gave us our peace. And he took that punishment. He took our brokenness. He took our pain. And so that we could have peace, we could have, and we spoke about the word shalom, uh, that in all inclusive word that talks about total, complete well-being that encompasses many things, not just uh, healing of our souls, but our bodies, our completeness, our wellness, our uh, health, our safety, our uh, prosperity. So the, the word peace we looked at as an all-encompassing word being shalom. So all that Jesus did on the cross uh, included all of this. And uh, that's the covenant he has with us. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Abni. Okay. Um, others? One point at least uh, is fine. You don't have to go in an order, but at least one point that you remember that you uh, that you can highlight, that will be helpful too. We spoke about many things last week. Uh, hello, and good morning. Good morning, Abhinas. Yes, so I just want to uh, point out one thing. Uh, there is something from God that uh, he desired, and that's God desired to restore us. And it's not something that we achieve or buy, but it's already provided and done by him on that cross. So, uh, this is the time that we have to know the fact of what what says about restoration and just believe and have faith and get that restoration. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinas. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's not uh, a restoration of our souls is not something we can buy. Uh, it's something that is already given to us and he God desires, he is desirous to make us whole in our spirit and our soul and in our bodies. And he has already given us the means of that restoration. And it's nothing that we earn or we buy, but through our belief in Christ and what he's done for us, it becomes ours. So we, we take it, we uh, hold it as ours. <clears throat> There's nothing that, nothing more that you and I need to do. Everything that is done has been sufficiently completed, finished at the work of the cross. Thank you, Avinas. Wonderful. All right. Uh, Avni has said um, what we did learn also was through the um, through what Christ did for us, we were bought from darkness into light. We were purchased from darkness into from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light so that was what we read in colossians 1 3 to 15 that he delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son of his love so he translated to uh, he he took us out of darkness and translated the kingdom of light to us so we expect to get rid of every kind of brokenness and darkness in our lives because now we are in the kingdom of light. Excellent. Thank you, Avni. All right. What what other things did we learn? There are many things, and I'm here for a few more people uh, before we go on. From curse into blessing. Okay. All right. So we did see. Uh, thank you, Abhijit. Right. It, Abhishek. Okay. Abhishek. So we did see that. Um, uh, um, you know we. The law is not able to 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 keep us um, in in the uh, I sorry uh, when we are unable to keep the law, and that results naturally in the curse of the law being on us. But when Jesus died on the cross, he bought us out of that curse and blessing because he himself became a curse for us. Galatians three thirteen he said. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. So he took on 
the curse for us. Uh, all that he did, um, it was it was the wrath of God over him. What should have been over us, the curse that should have been over us, was taken by Christ. And in turn, we had the blessing of Abraham, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us in Christ Jesus. And we receive <clears throat> the promise through that faith in what he's done on the cross. So excellent. Yes, from curse to blessing. What else did we learn? One or two more people? You know, I can wait like this and have somebody answer. Maybe someone who hasn't spoken up until now. Satan was defeated at the cross. Thank you. Yes, Avni. So what we do see is the cross was the place of the defeat of Satan. And uh, we, we see in uh, scripture in Colossians 2.25, it says, he disarmed all principalities and powers. So he triumphed over every principality. And uh, he made a public spectacle of them. That's what Colossians 2.25 says. So the Lord Jesus conquered and defeated Satan and all his demons on the cross. And the victory that he won is now yours and mine. And we walk in that victory. We walk in the triumph of the cross. So Jesus won <clears throat> the victory and he shares that victory with us so that we also can walk in that victory. You know, it says in Isaiah 53, 12, he divides the spoil with the strong. So the victory that he won, he divides... Uh, um, whatever he's got with with us so yes we have moved from <clears throat> um defeat into victory okay um what else i think you can see some more we, we asked, should not be yes, <clears throat> we should not be affected by the lies of the enemy satan will try to do so many things create confusion then mm -hmm. uh, create play with our thoughts so we mm -hmm. should not be affected by this. We should keep our faith in our Lord and Christ. Yes. And then only yes. we can move forward. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sissy. Yeah. So this we had seen uh, a couple of weeks back where Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He is a deceiver. He is a liar. He's the one who brings about thoughts um, that are lies to us. And um, that puts us in that state of emotional brokenness, but uh, recognizing that Christ has purchased all of that and he speaks truth over us. And that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at today. He speaks truth over us and it is in that that we have um, victory. Thank you, Sissy. Anita, um, Anita has mentioned he asks us to follow him for our benefit. Okay. All right. Uh, any other basis for our healing and deliverance? What else did we talk about? We spoke about the cross. We spoke about one more thing. What was the second point that we, that we considered? The second point we considered? What happens to us when we believe in Jesus? What are we made? We are made a new creation. New creation. Very good. Yes, we are made a new creation. So new creation is something that is new. It's something that doesn't exist earlier. And all things change. Our souls, our identity, our lives. We have a new nature, a fresh standing before God, a position, a new position before God. Everything has changed. So, you know, as 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Now all things are of God. So we have every right to walk free from anything or everything that holds us captive or enslaved in our lives. 
um, before we came to Christ, before we came to Christ, all those things that enslaved us, we have every right to walk in that freedom because of this new identity, because of the new power, because we walk in that newness of life. It's like, <clears throat> you know, I remember in school, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you feel this way, that, uh, you know, when you come up to the ninth and the 10th grade, you are naturally uh, positioned into a place of authority and um, leadership. And more so, a lot of the um, school leaders are chosen from the ninth and the 10th grade, right? So maybe till eighth, you're probably common man. But suddenly, when you come to ninth and 10th, you have a, you know, you have a leadership um, tag on you. And some, so we had something called as an installation where, you know, we were all, um, those who were chosen were given certain um, titles. And that, with that title, you know, you become like a new person. You understand, you have a responsibility, you have a new identity, and you use that authority and that power uh, against you know, your juniors, um, either to pull them up for dirty shoes, pull them up for unclean uniform, or pull them up for wrong behavior. You have that new identity, okay? So yeah, I'm just giving you examples so that you know you have a, have a way to connect um, what we have. Of course, the identity we have in Christ is much more than a school identity. Um, but what he's given us is something new and we operate from that. So as we walk in this new creation, we are transformed and we are also conformed into Christ like this. So all that is not of Christ uh, or that is like him will be taken out and we are, we are, we'll be consecrated. Uh, we, we consecrate every part of our being into uh, what God desires, being totally consecrated to God. So this is these things are foundational for our belief. All right, thank you. Right, so um, we were looking at the basis of our healing and deliverance, and from this we spoke about the two points, the first one being what is it that we have received. Um, uh, the basis of our healing and deliverance is because of what Jesus did on the cross, and we saw that because of that, we have complete wholeness. We've been moved from darkness to light. We've moved from curse to blessing. And we've also um, uh, have victory because of what Jesus done. And, and naturally, that brings about the defeat of Satan. And the second part we looked at is we are new creation. And having and being that new creation, we have that um, uh, that is the basis. That's what we stand on. These are foundations that we stand on, those pillars of the house that we stand on, where we exercise our authority uh, to, you know, to, to declare healing, to, to, to bring about deliverance on, um, on us and others. Oh, uh, I, I think I just quickly forgot to mention, but before this, we did talk about the difference between the three. Right? What is healing? What is deliverance? And what is wholeness? We spoke about that in, in some length. I'm just going to quickly run through that in case anybody missed this. Um, healing is what we, uh, it's, it's like a repairing. It's like bringing back uh, that which is damaged or that which is uh, unwhole. So that's what it is. It, it's repairing. And um, I remember we spoke about a, a real life example right of, of when especially when someone has a physical disease what would healing mean um you know and, and the process of it and it kind of likened it for us to have a better understanding deliverance is being set free from the work of spirits or demonic spirits in the areas which uh, which really affect our soul and uh, wholeness or journeying into wholeness is something that we continue doing. It's a regular process. It's an ongoing process that we do to stay whole and to keep to keep emotionally um, well. Okay, so we will we will be looking at more of uh, this of, of how do we reach re receive healing? How do we receive deliverance? How do we walk in that 
that place of wholeness in the in the classes to come. So looking at, we're going to be um, dealing with the next three points for our basis of healing and deliverance. And uh, the third uh, foundational truth that we we believe in and we um, we hold to is the authority that Jesus has given us to expel demons, the authority to cast out demons. And that's the basis of uh, receiving it, knowing that you are in a place of authority. So um, before we read out the verse, just to uh, understand that, you just did not leave us defenseless. Uh, he He's limited what Satan and his um, demons, uh, the way they work, by permission. So if God is the one who draws that boundary, he cannot cross it. So often the problem comes when we fail to recognize the permission that we have either through our ignorance or through our sin or through our apathy or through our just um, unbelief too, right? So that's something that God's given to us. And if we fail to see that or fail to re recognize <clears throat> that you have been given an authority and don't execute that, uh, that's when there, there arises a, a problem. So as joint heirs with Christ, we have received what he has. That is authority over, um, or over demonic power. And we, we also see this in, um, and maybe we could just read up a couple of verses so that we can, we can understand this. Uh, so this, <clears throat> you see that in the ministry of Jesus, the disciples received this authority right from the beginning. And if somebody can uh, quickly open up Luke um, chapter 10, verse 17, would someone open and read that, please? Luke 10, 17. 17 and 19. Could someone read that for me? Luke, 7, Luke 10, 17 and 19. Shall I read, ma'am? <coughs> yes, please go ahead. Go ahead. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and 19. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Verse 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Okay, so you see here that the disciples were given this authority by, by Jesus and said, you know, the, the, I give you the authority to uh, trample over all the powers of the enemy. Uh, I'll make a reference to one more verse. That's uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Mark 16, verse 17. Would somebody kindly read that? Somebody else, please can read that. That's that's there in your notes, by the way. Mark 16, 17 and 18. Yeah, can I read that, Apostle? Yes, 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 please read. Uh, Mark 16, 17, 18. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Thank you. Yeah. So this verse shows that these are the signs that follow all those who believe. And in the name of Jesus, you will cast out demons. And it talks about other things too. Speak new tongues. It will. Um, you will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So that authority is given to to the disciples, 
And it says, these signs will follow all those who believe in my name. And that includes you and me and all of the, all those who believe in his name. The authority that gives us. So it's, um, when we're looking at authority, it's about exercising the authority. So think of, um, think of a policeman who has been given the authority to stop traffic, okay? But he has to get there and exercise that authority. He has to do it in faith, knowing that what is vested in him is something that he can use for law and order in, you know, in, uh, on the roads or wherever he is, he is placed. So the authority that is given to him has to be, it has to be executed by him. And that's, that's where that comes to us as believers, that knowing that, uh, that, this, uh, that, that there is one thing about authority and there is one about power. So if you have authority but don't execute that power, it's worthless, right? So authority without power is worthless, but we receive this power because of what we have in the Holy Spirit. So we are equipped with that authority and with the power of the Holy Spirit to defeat any kind of harassment um, of, from, you know, from de demons or from uh, any kind of a demonic activity. So we have been given that authority in Jesus' name to cast out demons. All right. So that is the uh, next foundational truth, even as we stand for healing and deliverance. So this, remember that this is the authority is not just for deliverance, but also to heal. You see that they will lay hands on the sick. So even healing, uh, I know we're, we're really classifying and talking about emotional wholeness here, but the authority is there in all these areas for us to uh, lay hands on the sick for healing, um, bring about restor restoration, and also cast out uh, any uh, demons and demonic activity. Okay. Um, before I go to the next point, I just want to break here and <clears throat> ask for any specific questions, if you all may have on this. Any questions? I think I just want to also add one thing um, in that verse that's there, um, because I, I often see that that becomes like, uh, I mean, these questions have come out. So if you look at um, yeah, Mark 16, 18, okay? It says, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. I know this is outside of what we are, what we're talking about, but I just wanted to bring this verse um, uh, because I'm sure there may be, uh, you would have come, come across the question, is that, so does that mean that, uh, you know, you can take up a snake or, you know, drink its poison and nothing is going to happen to you? Does that give you the authority to be able to do that? This is a side thing, but I wanted to bring it up because that, uh, Verses put there. Uh, does what I'd, I'd like to? I'm, I'm opening this up because uh, you know I, I want to hear from from you all as well. What what do you? How do you all see that verse? What do you think is the reference to that? Any thoughts? Either today is a very sleepy class. What's okay, that? thank you, Maggie. You always uh, respond when I say that. <laughs> yes, Maggie, go ahead. <laughs> thank yes. you. Um, for me, it's not about uh, the snake itself. It's about the danger and any other uh, trap that that the enemy might put before before us. That he will be able to deliver us. He will he will take us through that. Thank you, first. Okay, very good. All right. 
Um, anybody else? Uh, Kennedy, you, you've written it calls for Logos and Rima. Would you want to expand on that? Yes, uh, Christopher, you could you could uh, unmute and speak. And I, I don't know, I don't know if Kennedy's able to. Yes, go ahead, Christopher. Uh, yes, yeah, so the way I read this is that, um, um, you know, uh, we, we uh, need to, you know, seek uh, and ask for protection against, against these kind of um, events taking place. And uh, for example, if, you know, we, go, we are going into a, into an area which is um, where there is, it's possible possible that you know there are snakes or you know um, other, other other sort of uh, um, uh, animals that could be of danger. Uh, we are asking for protection, <clears throat> and um, uh, inadvertently, if you know by by chance uh, this happens, then you know we are we are uh, asking for you know asking for the protection to be able to. You know, to be able to deal with that and not, you know, not, uh, uh, you know, not die, um, you know, because of that. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. The other, the other point is that um, I don't think um, one should, um, you know, uh, claim to, you know, have this protection and then make make it a make you know sort of make it make it a sort of an, a demonstration or an example of this by by taking the taking some poison and then you know trying to uh indicate to you know to to people that you know that we are you know we have got this protection and uh i think there have been there have been cases of of holy men or you know pastors or you know maybe in, within christianity or even within other religions who have, have made this as a, made this made this point and then um, you know they've they've not uh, not survived such a such a such a incident. So I think that that I think that is foolishness um, on the part of of a, of someone who wants to you know make a make a demonstration of it. Thank you, thank you, great. I'm so glad that there is clarity on this. Yes, I think Kennedy, did you lift your did you yeah, raise your hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Kennedy. Uh, what I just wanted to say is uh, <clears throat> gives us more of. Uh, not just a literal meaning. There's more than literal meaning in that word. So <clears throat> we learn the aspect of the truth and how to interpret and get more revelation. It's not just the literal poison, the literal serpent. There's a deeper meaning in that. Thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So it's not a literal meaning. It's the truth that's applied to that. I think Avni has also written a talks of divine protection and power over Satan's attacks, uh, uh, absolutely. So that is an example that we look at. If you look at it in, in Acts, um, trying to look up the reference. That's uh, Acts uh, I think 28, I think. Yeah, I think Acts 28. It talks of how, you know, a snake bit Paul while he was on the island of Malta and uh, no harm came to him. Uh, but it does not mean that he went around looking for the snake in an uh, effort to prove his faith. So the sna snake bit him unexpectedly in front of many others, and God protect him, protected him as promised. So any kind of practice to prove one's faith or to prove one God's protection I, I think it's a violation of the command that God's given him. He says, don't put your Lord, your God to the test. Uh, we see that in Deuteronomy. And again, it's uh, um, when, when Jesus uh, is at the place of the temptation, he, he says that do not put your Lord, your God to the, to the test. So attempting to force the Lord's hand by requiring that he should perform an obvious miracle is definitely something that is foolish and it is sinful to test God's power or his protection or his presence by purposely putting yourself in any kind of an unsafe situation is definitely sinful and also forbidden. As it says, do not put your Lord, your God to the test. So I think another example that we can see is that of Daniel. You know, Daniel is not that he sought out the lines and he went in there to test, 
but he found himself surrounded by them because of the judgment that the king had put and it was no fault of his own and he did find god protecting him there so um we trust god in dangerous situations but uh, you know let's be careful not to purposely put ourselves in a place of danger quoting this that we can take up serpents and drink something po poisonous and it will not harm us so that's something that we need to be careful about right yeah she i think you have a, a question not a comment <clears throat> a comment actually just when you were talking about daniel I, I just remember the story my mom used to tell us about the guy back home whose name was daniel and so he goes to a zoo in the south in the southwest part of the country i come from and then he says because his name is daniel he's going to enter into the um where the lion was kept and he entered in and the lion actually was actually uh, amazed <laughs> it actually reacted it moved back when it entered when he entered and then he kept calling out to the lion and all of a sudden the lion pounced on him and tore him to pieces so just to stress your point on never testing the lord i just thought i just mentioned that because that was the story that stuck with me throughout my childhood <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Shay. Yeah, so I think that that makes it um, clear on on what you know what we're saying. To be able to take the authority, Shay, did you lift your uh, raise your hand once again, or was that by mistake? Okay. Sorry, that was a mistake. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so being so understanding that uh, you know the authority given to us is uh, um, is something that we use with wisdom and use with power but but of course not um to prove or to test god uh, in ways to so be to being careful about about that okay so that's the third foundational uh, truth or basis of our healing and our deliverance okay uh we'll move to the next point which is the anointing of the holy spirit right um so I think before we we understand this, uh, I maybe I'd like to hear from you all. Uh, what would you mean by the anointing of the Holy Spirit? And I'm sure you've heard this term over and over again that you know he's an anointed uh, preacher. Uh, you know there is an anointing in the service. There is an anointing in the work that he does. So what do you mean by by anointing? Yeah, I'm leaving it open so that uh, I, you know, this this uh, this entire course is very slow paced, and there's a lot more time for interactions. Unlike unlike the other, there are many things to cover. This has been placed really um, crisply. So I'd like to just spend some time just to also hear the rest of you. One way I can get to hear all of you talk. Yeah. So what would you mean by the anointing, the word anointing, or the term anointing? And these are, please feel free to share. And uh, this is just, and this is how we all learn. Uh, you know, none of us are perfect, but we look back to the word of God. We learn as we discuss and talk. So please take time to think and um, share what you think. Yeah. So what, what do you think is anointing? Uh, Pastor, I think. Yes, Mangi. The anointing uh, in. If, if if we we look the what it means, not 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 trying to go into theology or Greek or any other words, it basically means uh, being given authority and power mm. to act on God's behalf, and He will enable you to do it. Thank okay, you. thank you, Mangi. So Mangi said it's the authority and power given to you by god on his behalf to um to minister or to to work to uh, see things happening kennedy says it's divine power to perform a purpose that's god given yes yes Shay. go ahead yes pastor i'll just take my um um my understanding of 
anointing from 1 John 2.27, where it talks about that there's an anointing that abides in you, and you have no need of anyone to teach you. In essence, what he was just saying, teach you right or wrong, that he will teach you about all things. So first and foremost, uh, the anointing is the Holy Spirit himself. And then from him, he can now supply anointing to us to do supernatural things here on earth. And it can go to any length. It's not only just restricted to just within the church. It can be within our organization. It could be, you know, uh, on the sports field, anywhere in society where God wants us to express his kingdom influence so that men will come to know Jesus Christ. So that's the anointing is the Holy Spirit and ability, the power to do uh, supernatural things on the earth to display the glory of Jesus and to bring people to the knowledge of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. That's, that's lovely. That's good. Thank you. Uh, Samuel, uh, I think there's someone else who said, the presence and power, the presence of God and power that is displayed through us. Uh, Samuel's written, it's the ability, the favor, the grace from above to do things that we are not capable of doing on our own. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts from the rest of the class? I'm sure we all think of something, right? We, we keep uh, something that's been set apart for a specific function. Okay. All right. So being anointing is um, the thought of being consecrated for some specific work or specific purpose or specific function. Okay. That is an alternate meaning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, Yes, the rest, we've had, what, five, six responses. There are 30 of us, 32 of us here. I'd like to hear everybody walking in the fullness of God's power, okay, in a place of walking in, in God's power in, in everything, all right? Anything else? Having, having the nature of God and displaying God's power, sanctification. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think a lot of you have um, uh, come to a place of, you know, good understanding of what, what that is. So the truth is that all believers in Jesus have been anointed. With what? With the Holy Spirit. So if you look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, could somebody read that please? 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. First John chapter 2, verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Okay. So there are, uh, if you look at other versions, it talks of, you have had the Holy Spirit poured out on you by Christ, and so all of you know the truth. Or, But you have an unction from the Holy Ulta, Spirit. Gadi Could you kindly uh, mute, please? Thank you. So uh, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Another version says, um, but you are not like that for the Holy Spirit has come upon you and all of you know the truth. So the, um, so what, what we know is, uh, you know, if, uh, John talks about it even in Acts, it says of how he bestows the Holy Spirit to all those who trust him. So the Holy Spirit is given to all those who are believers in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and the anointing, <clears throat> the, we've been anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and uh, bringing again the verse that she spoke about in first john 2 27 it says the anointing that you received from him that is what we saw in verse 20 from the holy spirit abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you but as his anointing teaches you about anything anything and everything it is true and it is no lie just as it has taught in you abide in him so those who believe in jesus christ have received this anointing you will see that even paul refers to the anointing of the uh, of the holy spirit and uh, we see that in 2 corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 so could somebody read that 2 corinthians Chapter 1, verse 21. Can somebody read that? <laughs> 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21. Shall I read them? Yes, go ahead, Apni. <laughs> Second Corinthians one twenty one says, "Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God." Mm. So here again, Paul refers to the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and this is that reference in the New Testament to the anointing of the Spirit for the believer, and that's what's found in the writing of Paul to the Corinthian church, and that's what he says. So Paul wrote that each believer had received or has received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We also find that Jesus himself was anointed with the Spirit. So when he began his public ministry, he reads, um, he, he reads a passage from, uh, from Isaiah, and you see that in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And I think I will just read that out. Just give me a minute. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. So it says, uh, so, and he, uh, 17 onwards, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus himself being anointed with the Holy Spirit as he began his public ministry has said he was anointed by the Lord to do the work of the ministry. So uh, that is, uh, we know where the anointing comes from. Anointing comes from the power of the Holy Spirit to all of us who are believers, okay? When we will close for a break, when we come back, we'll just look at how that becomes like a foundational truth for us as the basis for our healing and our deliverance, okay? Uh, the time is 10.50 on my clock. Uh, let's, let's return back at 11 o'clock. You could go quickly grab a cup of coffee and come back. See you all soon. <laughs> 